This is the Tips for Lawyers podcast, and this is Chris Hargraves here with episode number 20-something. I think it's going to be episode number 25, and today I want to have a talk about risk, which is an interesting topic for lawyers because we're not very good at risk. I'll get to what I mean by that in just a minute, but let's start with the usual little introductory speech where I encourage you strongly to head over to iTunes and you can find the link very easily at tipsforlawyers.com slash iTunes and to leave a five-star review and a comment or two so that I know what you like and what you don't like. Although be gentle, please, if you're going to tell me what you don't like. But do go and leave a review. It makes a huge difference to me. It gives me some encouragement. It also helps the podcast stay visible in iTunes. If you're not yet subscribed, then you could subscribe there as well by clicking the button. Not too hard. And then you can make sure you never miss out on another Tips for Lawyers podcast episode. You can find all the episodes, however, at tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast. And there you will be able to see any of the show notes, any of the links I refer to in any of these episodes as well. So, why do I want to talk about risk? Well, a little while ago I sent an email for my email newsletter, uh, which you can also get at tipsforlawyers.com if you haven't already, go and sign up. Uh, It's pretty easy. It's in the sidebar of nearly every page. Just enter your email address and uh, you'll get the email newsletter. And in this particular newsletter, I referred to an article by Seth Godin, who if you've listened to me at all or read anything that I've written, uh, then you'll know that I am a big fan of Seth's. And He had written a short little blog post called A Bird in Search of a Cage. Now, I'm not going to read it out to you. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes to that particular blog post. It's not very long. Take a minute and read it. And it was a fascinating headline to me, and it really caught my attention, and it clearly caught the attention of some of you as well, because I got a number of emails in response to that newsletter uh, from people who found the story very interesting, because it's interesting when we think about birds and we think about them generally craving freedom, and we like to think of ourselves in that kind of sense as well, looking to open doors, open the cage, spread our wings, head out into the wide world, but is that actually what our experience is like, or is that just an ideal, is that just a dream that hits us every now and again? where we think about perhaps we want to spread our wings, we want to do the thing that's ahead of us, we want to undertake the big project, we want to do that particular aspiration that's been on our mind for years and years, but something stops us. Something has us turn around and something has us walk back to the cage. And that's why I wanted to talk about risk, because it is a fundamental issue with lawyers, that we are so risk-averse that we are paralyzed. We, in fact, cannot function properly. We cannot take enough risk in our own lives. And as a result, we do end up in a problem state. Now, part of it is to do with our stress and our dislike of our job because we end up being so risk-averse that, in fact, we end up doing the same thing every day, day in, day out. We don't change our habits. We don't break the mold. We don't tell our bosses how perhaps things could be done better or more efficiently or about a new product or a new service or a new way of thinking or a new way of communicating. We don't want to break that mold and as a result what ends up happening? We turn into our boss or our senior. We turn into the person from whom we learn because we don't want to disrupt the system. Disrupting the system, after all, might call attention to us. And we don't want attention. We want just enough attention, as a rule, to make sure that we get our job done, we get a pat on the back every now and again, and we get paid without getting fired. But we don't want to draw too much attention to ourselves. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to take a risk. We don't want to stick our hand up in case the answer is wrong. After all, what if you propose the big idea and it doesn't work? You don't want that kind of attention, do you? What if you stick your hand up because you think you know the answer, but you get it wrong? 
you don't want that kind of attention either. So instead you go to class and you go to work and you don't call attention to yourself because you prefer to stay in the cage. And while you might dream about doing big things and you might read books and you might be encouraged and you might have morning daily aspirations to do something bigger and better and more important, the reality is every day looks just like the last because you won't take the risk. Why is that, do you think? Partly it's because you've been trained not to take risks. The current education model doesn't cater for people who take risks. It caters for people who get it right. That's the only important thing. It's having the right answer. It's doing it the right way. It's doing it the way you've been taught without breaking the mould, without pushing the boundaries of the box, without even finding the boundaries of the box. Do what you're told in the way you've been told. Get it right and you will do fine. You will get an A. You will get a pat on the back. You will get a small to middling pay rise. Perhaps you will earn your bonus. But will you have actually achieved anything? Will you have taken a risk? Will you have done something more? Will you have added to the world something that wasn't there before? The answer is, of course, no. All you're doing is repeating what has been told to you. But that is what was taught to you in school. You put up your hand if you know the answer. You write on the blackboard if you know the answer. You get a star or you get a tick. And the same happened in university too. You weren't encouraged to think outside the box. Some things took the form of thinking outside the box, to be sure. But in reality, what you were doing was repeating how you had been told to do things. A classic example comes to mind here of my own university education. And right at the first year, when I was still enthusiastic and hadn't become too cynical yet, although I've always been a little bit cynical, right at the start, there was a particular case study I had to do, and the question went something like this. Write what this case taught you about X. And so I did. I wrote what the case taught me about X. And I got the comments back, and I did okay, but I didn't do as well as I would have hoped. And one of the comments was, Chris, you should have written about this. And the instant thought I had to myself was this, but the case didn't teach me that. The question asked me, in what was a remarkable piece of open-ended questioning, what did I learn from the case? It didn't ask me what are the things that some people could have learned from the case. It didn't say, what does this case demonstrate in relation to X? It said, what did I learn? And so I had written what I learned, but apparently that wasn't right or it wasn't enough. You see, university education, and law school in particular, has taught you not to take risks. And that only gets worse because you're taking risks not with your own decision-making as time goes on, you're taking risks with clients. And we don't want to risk things with clients, just like we don't want to risk attention to ourselves. And so at the end of the day, we end up like the bird who is in search of the cage. We find ourselves outside the cage occasionally, and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to take a risk because we haven't been taught that it is in fact okay to fail. We knew this as kids, didn't we? We knew this when we tried to build a cubby house, just like our dads might have done, but without the aid of the parent in question. We got out the hammer, we got out the nails, and we did things that looked like we were building a cubby house, and we had a good go at it, and we failed miserably. And then the next day we got up and we tried again. We came up with a new harebrained scheme, or well, there was the kids who tried to jump off things because they watched a Superman movie and they thought they could fly if only they said the right combination of words. They didn't care that they kept failing, they kept trying again because their imaginations were still free. They were still able to take risks. They still understood that failure was an acceptable outcome to an endeavour. What do you think of failure? Is it an acceptable outcome to you to fail? I don't think it is. I don't think it is for most law firms, and I certainly don't think it is for most lawyers. I think you have been trained into thinking that failure is in fact wrong or unacceptable in some way. And from time to time that is in fact true, but most often it is not. 
the things that we tell ourselves we shouldn't do or can't do or won't do, the things that keep us inside the cage, are the exact things that have been trained out of us. But if we remain in the cage, then our view is going to stay the same all the time. A couple of episodes ago I spoke about control and I spoke about why lawyers don't like their jobs. One of the things I didn't touch on here was the mental issue facing lawyers in that we have become so risk-averse that we personally cannot grow. We personally can't grow and we can't take risks because we're afraid of the outcome and we've been taught that failure is not an option and is unacceptable. And so instead of continually striving to break the boundaries, to invent something new, to invest ourselves emotionally in our jobs, to offer something different, we offer the same. And we try and distinguish ourselves upon the same methods that everyone has always distinguished themselves. We try and either be more cost-effective, more efficient, more approachable. Perhaps we try and be better experts at our jobs. But really, do you think you're going to be a better expert at your job than the other 75,000 lawyers in your state or your country? Do you really think you can be that much of an expert that you can out-expert everybody else? I doubt it. So how are you going to distinguish yourself? How are you going to take a risk? How are you going to change the world? The number of lawyers I know who got into law school because they wanted to make a difference in this world and come out the other end, unable to even conceive of how they might doing that, is remarkable. Why is it? Because they've been trained not to think that way anymore. They've been trained to think in terms of what has gone before, not in terms of what can come in the future. Because thinking about what comes in the future might in fact put an idea in your head that you have to try something new. And trying something new might fail. And if you fail, that's unacceptable. So what risks are you prepared to take then? You're prepared to get on the bus. The bus might crash. You're prepared to take that risk. Are you prepared to fly? Are you prepared to walk? To cycle? Are you prepared to put up your hand and propose an idea that might fail? Are you prepared to go ahead with that idea even if you're told that you shouldn't? because you genuinely believe it's the best thing that should happen for the clients or the firm? Are you prepared to stick your neck out? What happens? What is the worst case scenario? You could get fired. You might lose your job. You might be ridiculed. You might call attention to yourself as the crazy person. Perhaps you're that person who keeps trying things and failing. Look up Thomas Edison one day. Have a look at how many attempts there were to create the light bulb. Do you wish that he'd given up? That he'd only look at what came before and not had a vision in his head of what could come in the future? What if he hadn't failed enough times to get to the version that worked? And so it has to be with us. If you want to be a lawyer who genuinely stands out, who genuinely makes a difference, who genuinely is a force for change in the world, then you have to be prepared to take a risk. You have to be prepared to fail. You have to understand that failure is an acceptable outcome. And perhaps failure will lead you to your success. You need to fail over and over and over again until you succeed. You'll notice I haven't even touched really on what risks you might want to take. And that's because I don't know. I don't understand where you're at, what risks you might take, but I know you're probably not taking very many at all. I know you're probably not stepping too far outside your comfort zone. And your comfort zone is where you go to die. If you can't keep pressing the boundaries, if you can't keep shipping new ideas, if you can't keep generating things that people think are stupid then at the end of the day, you're simply going to become a replica of the people around you. Not standing out too much, doing your job well enough, going home each day, and then doing it again. But what if tomorrow, you decide to take that idea that's been stewing in your mind and to start putting it into practice? What would happen then? What change could you make? What attention could you call to issues, 
to people, to the law, to lawyers, to yourself? What attention could you bring if you were willing to take the risk? I'll leave you with that thought. This has been Tips for Lawyers, episode number 25. Go and take some risks. Be prepared to fail. Bad things might happen, but better things could happen.